Thanks so much everyone for watching. We've got an epic lineup tonight of speakers. We've got an awesome panel here. Amazing group of functional doctors, technology, activists uh, for here for Elite Board in Medicine. You know, our goal is to make it easy for practitioners to learn in community. This ecosystem that is being set up by the meetup groups, we believe will be the future ecosystem of this evolved primary care network, and it all revolves around you. Welcome to the Functional Forum. Thanks for joining us in the charge to accelerate the evolution of medicine. Please welcome your host, James Masco. Hello and welcome to the Functional Forum. This month we are talking about practice resilience. It has become clear in the year 2020 that many medical practices, family medicine, primary care, and functional medicine were ill-prepared for something like COVID. And so this month, we're gonna to talk to clinics that have not only survived, but thrived during the pandemic and see what we can learn from them. Enjoy. So first up, we have come to Boise, Idaho to check in with the team of Functional Medicine Idaho. I first came across them at the end of 2018 when they joined our Practice Accelerator. And over the last two years, they have added multiple locations, multiple new practitioners, and there's a lot to learn about how they've been resilient in the pandemic. Let's go and check it out. All right, we are here with Amber Warren. She is the co-owner of the clinic here and a physician's assistant. And I guess let's just start by talking about how you ended up getting into functional medicine. Pretty cool journey. So I started my career in orthopedic surgery and just really started to appreciate anatomy. And it was there that I missed more of like the internal real true medicine. So I transitioned over at our sister clinic, which was rheumatology. And I spent five years practicing um, rheumatology with a lot of chronic autoimmune disease. And I really started to um, encourage my patients towards appropriate nutrition and lifestyle because that's always been a passion of mine without even having really true training in it, just kind of learning on my own because they don't teach that in medical or, or for me, PA school. Um, so I noticed as I started to really encourage my patients um, their diseases got better, their symptoms improved, their med list, my nurse would print out their med list for me and, and it would shorten, instead of it being four pages long, it was all of a sudden one or two pages because they no longer needed a lot of these medications. And so I just started to kind of dig deep and investigate more about gut health and, and really root cause medicine, right? And so I'm mandating these people with really toxic, expensive um, autoimmune biological drugs and realize that there's got to be a better way. Um, you know, I signed an oath saying to do no harm. And if that's really the goal, then I need to try and get these patients off medications and figure out other ways to manage and monitor their diseases. So I stumbled across um, the Institute for Functional Medicine and started just doing some of my own um, continuing medical education that way, and here I am. Yeah, I've heard you know some of the story here today from from your husband, um, uh, but I'd love to just you know when we first spoke, Tamara gave me a call and said she thought that you know what we were doing with the practice accelerator was like a yeah. the sort of the moment for you guys as you were buying this clinic, and yeah. you know I know Sam had a big vision from the start about what you could do. Tell us yeah. about like sort of like the early days of just yeah. running the practice and how sort of that ended up moving to this point where you've got this huge team. Yeah, so. Tamara was key, right? I met Tamara at um, an, an annual in, uh, uh, Institute for Functional Medicine um, conference. And so I felt like Tamara's passion and her talent was really that she could kind of bridge that gap between Sam and I, because he's got the MBA, he's the business, business background, but no clinical experience. And I'm on the other end where I've got a lot of the clinical experience, but I, I you know, no business background and really not having not wanting much to do with that piece of what we were doing. Yeah. So when Sam said, I'll run the business, you just have to run the clinical side. I was like, okay, if that's, if that, if that's the case I'm in, let's do this. So Tamara with her RN and her business background was really allowing us to kind of make, make happen what we needed to make happen. Um, where Sam was really able to gain that experience and learn what we were doing within the medical model was from the practice accelerator program. So I think that really that allowed him to kind of put some different protocols and procedures into place and where we really needed to focus. Like a big thing for him with what he learned from you in the beginning was 
we have to develop a niche. Each of our practitioners has, has to have some kind of specialty, right? Let's, let's get this women's health team on board. Let's be able to really hone in on that. Um, let's get a pediatrician on board. Let's be able to hone in on kids in the first three years of life and really, really put that into practice. Mm -hmm. Let's get, you know, let's really make sure we're marketing my background with autoimmune diseases and rheumatologic conditions. Cause that's, let's be honest, that's an epidemic in our country, right? Yeah. That, that's kind of autoimmune disease. It's just, it's getting up there with obesity and diabetes. So um, that was really helpful in the beginning. So really getting Sam some experience on the clinical side of things um, allowed him to come in and just boom, set the stage for where we needed to go and what we needed to develop to ultimately be successful. Yeah, one of the things that I'm just super impressed with is just like the team that you guys have built. Take us through the process of how you've thought through how you bring the team and who's doing what. Yeah, so I have to give all the credit to Sam and Tamara there because they've built us an incredible team and really, what they look for first and foremost, experience aside, a person story aside, is just if they're gonna be a good part of our family and they're gonna be a good culture fit and they're gonna come alongside and be passionate about what we're doing and wanna change people's lives. And so they've really taken that interview process to a new level in my opinion, where they're asking all the questions and making sure that people are in this for the right reason and wanting to join a team of people that is um, moving this train forward. Someone early on when we bought this business gave me really good advice and they said, you're gonna have people that are on this moving train and wanna have the same vision and the same mission where you guys are going and then you're gonna have people that don't want change and that are gonna kind of just be the caboose and be the break and drag you guys along. And you have to be okay letting those people go and, and realizing that not everybody wants to really grow and, and go through some hard times and have some challenges and be a little uncomfortable at times. So that's really who we've looked for. And then people that just can fit and be really passionate about their specific position. You know, we've got a patient care coordinator, or I'm sorry, patient care navigator. And so they're that for, that person that first talks to our new patients and make sure they understand the process of what we're doing, make sure they understand that we're different than any other medical practice, right? You spend an hour with your practitioner in the yeah. very beginning, and we might not even touch you in that first hour. We wanna hear your story. We wanna hear what happened as a, as, a, as a child and hear how you got here and triggering events and, and what's formed you as a person and where you wanna be in three years, five years, 10 years, what does your life wanna look like? How can we help you get there? And so that person has to be comfortable kind of walking people through this process that don't know anything about what we do. So just really finding people that really want to be in those positions and without trying to put, you know, a, a, a round peg through a square hole. Absolutely. So one of the things that I see is, you know, that you guys have used functional medicine. And I heard this from, from the other providers that you've used functional medicine as almost like this unifying language to really get yeah. all these practitioners working together. Yeah. Um, tell, tell me a little bit about that, that journey and sort of the any aha moments along the way. Yeah, you know, so much of it, I think what I've really realized too, kind of getting into this world is functional medicine's unique, right? It's not integrative, it's not holistic. Like Mark Holthouse says, it's just good medicine. And so when we're really trying to focus on um, root cause medicine, we're looking at somebody as a whole, of course, but also really looking at what makes that person tick and when their illness started. Mm. And um, you have to be a really good listener. You have to be really compassionate. You have to be in this medicine for all the right reasons. Um, there's a lot of other subspecialties where you can go and make a lot of money, but we have to find people that, like I said, wanna improve people's lives and wanna change this community and wanna want to educate, want to reach people that would otherwise never hear our message about how we're approaching COVID right now and how we're approaching the immune system, right? And so um, I think people have to realize it takes an emotional toll on them and their family to be in this kind of medicine um, because we, we go deep with people and we want to know their story and we want to know their family and we want to get intimate with them. So really finding, again, the right kind of people and the right kind of quality in that person to, to really make it work. Yeah, this this episode that we're talking here is about is about practice resilience, and obviously, yeah. like the bigger the practice, the tougher it is to be resilient in the face of something like COVID that comes along yes. and changes the practice of medicine significantly. You've got family medicine that's yep. mainly out of business. You've got primary yes. care that's out of business. I mean, you guys have a lot of elements of that going on here. Tell us a little bit about sort of like some of the highs and lows of of being resilient to this you know this thing that wiped out like half of primary care. Oh my care. goodness, I know, really scary. Um, you know, the first couple of weeks we were we were scared and we were nervous. People, um, I think, bought into a lot of what was being told and bought into the fear mostly, yeah. and didn't want to come in, didn't want to leave their homes, didn't want to go out into the community, didn't want to come get labs, and we just pivoted. We as a team we came forward and said 
We have to educate right now. We have to tell people, now's the time to see our nutritionist. Now's the time to come and look at nutrient deficiencies and what could be impacting your immune system mm. and driving inflammation in the body. Now is not the time to sit at home and watch the news and be scared. Um, let's get outside, come in, let's do telemedicine visits. Let's, let's um, you know, we offered right away, we offered supplement pickup on the porch where our team would go out there or on the, uh, on the front of the building and our team would go out there and drop off supplements into people's cars. You have to be on vitamin C, you have to be on, on, on zinc. Um, Glutathione is really important, just things like that where we really tried to get that message out there through YouTube videos and uh, blog posts and um, you know social media videos where we were really just trying to educate the masses. And we, we made a turnaround. I mean, I feel like, again, there was maybe a little bit of dip in the patients that were coming in with in the first two or three weeks. But right away, as soon as we really pushed that education, we, there was no turning back. We've now been overwhelmed. And since then, we've hired three new practitioners, uh, one new nutritionist and another new health coach because the demand is there. I think people are starting to get it. They realize now is highest priority of when I should be really taking advantage of what I'm hearing and really trying to improve my health. It's really fun to follow along the clinic. You know, I know we, we've spoken every so often, but, uh, you know, on Instagram, seeing new providers being hired, seeing all these group visits, yeah. you know, I know big, a big piece for, for you guys and why you decided to take insurance and, and follow that model yeah. was because of access. Absolutely. And um, so what's it, what, what are some, some lessons that, that you've learned along the way about, uh, you know, what it means to really create access in an effective way for functional medicine? Well, we have to make this care affordable. If we're going to try and make this the future of medicine, it has to be accessible and it has to be affordable. So we can be primary care providers. I can, you know, I can do well women exams and I can do wellness exams and sports physicals and use those primary care um, codes to be able to get functional medicine covered, right? A person can have high blood pressure. I just treat it differently, but I can still use that diagnostic code that Blue Cross or Regents or our major insurances would accept and recognize. So that part has been really important. That's also how we've gotten um, you know, our group visits, our group education covered. We use the codes, depression, anxiety, that's rampant right now, right? Type one, type two diabetes. We use those codes to get the treatment and our care plans covered. And thankfully we have a lot of patients that have good insurance and also have flex health savings account or health savings account so they can get a lot of their supplements covered. Because again, we're, we're prescribing that supplement for a diagnosis. You know, I'm using different supplements and herbs for anxiety and I can put that down and they can get that covered through health savings. So that's really where our heart is. Gosh, some days it seems a lot easier to go cash pay, to not have to mess with the insurance world and not have to deal with that. But I have three children and I know that it would be a stretch for my family to pay cash to go see a functional medicine practitioner and to get that kind of care. Mm. And so we really, and, and that goes back to who we're looking to hire, right? We want everyone to be on that same page where we know we're valuable but we want to make this care affordable and accessible for a lot of different people. So previously on the Functional Forum, we have had interviews with Tom Moltaire and Dr. Mark Holthouse, and both of them have moved to Idaho to be part of the Functional Medicine Idaho vision. Let's check in with both of them to find out a little bit more about why they're here and what they think is possible at Functional Medicine Idaho. All right, we are here in Boise with the Chief Medical Officer of Functional Medicine Idaho, Dr. Mark Holthouse. Now, Doc, two years ago, I moved to Sacramento and I was like, me and Dr. Holthouse are gonna be buds. We're gonna like hang out, we're gonna do outdoor stuff, yeah, and then you left me. I know. So it must have been a pretty compelling <laughs> reason to, to come here. So uh, tell us a little bit about uh, the journey to, to move to Boise. Yeah, yeah, you know, it started about a year and a half ago, James, I was, um, looking at my concierge practice, hybrid concierge model, and I was thinking, man, there's a whole bunch of people I'm seeing in Costco every weekend that are kind of kicking the ground and you know, saying, oh, I'd love to still see you. I just, you got to where I couldn't afford you anymore. And uh, so that kind of put a seed in my head that, uh, man, there's all this working class folks that I've seen, you know, I was in the area for 30 years as a practitioner in El Dorado County in Northern California. Uh, I'd still like to see them. And uh, wouldn't it be nice if I could have some kind of business model that would allow me to have a little bit more variety that way. So I didn't have the big membership hurdle uh, as, as an issue for so many of these patients. It used to be in my practice, many of them for 20 years. So that got me thinking. And so I started looking around in the area. 
I found this practice in Boise doing some searches on, on some of the uh, functional medicine sites mm -hmm. on job opportunities, looking for a model that was kind of already up and running that had an insurance-based paradigm and the only really need that was being uh, for, for a model of membership was done uh, for people that didn't have a contract in insurance. So as opposed to being the default where everybody was paying a membership fee, it was kind of the minority of folks mm -hmm. that weren't insured or had no contract insurance that were using a membership. So the bottom line is the need uh, that it is prevalent everywhere, uh, I felt it was a better marriage, a better match with accessibility. Yeah. And so I became obsessed a year and a half ago with access. Yeah. I, I don't know, I've been in this about 15 years, long enough to see we've got all this great content, but we're not getting it to go viral as, as I would have wanted it to go. And I started analyzing what might be some of the hurdles there. And I think access was, was a big one. Yeah. So having a business model at FMI, Functional Medicine Idaho, in place with a group of people that had just incredible energy was, was really what landed me here. What started me looking was that business model desire to get more access. Yeah, well, I remember the last time we were hanging out, we were talking about group visits and I was sort of on the yeah. journey to, to make the book and I had just seen that was a, like a solution for the access. I know that that's a, that's a part of the, the vision here at Functional Medicine Idaho. You wanna talk a little bit about that? It's huge. You know, I, I saw back uh, in talking to Tony Jones and some of the people at Cleveland, they, they did that as necessity because they had a big wait list and wanted to get people going. Uh, so that kind of started things. Uh, Jeff Geller, some of the things that you, guys that you interviewed and talked last year, uh, we had so much on, on groups and, and of course, Shilpa's thing, Dr. Saxena's stuff. It got me really researching what that looked like. And what I quickly found out doing it in my own practice is that that was the most fun I've ever had as a doctor. Mm -hmm. I didn't want to do the one-on-one -on -one visits after how much fun we'd had in a group situation. Uh, so it was kind of the antidote for practitioner burnout. Yeah. And it was wonderful and that it, you got this great group dynamic and it really did help with the economy and scaling functional medicine, instead of saying the same thing, you know, eight times a day yeah. to eight different people, I was doing it, you know, once to 10 or 15 or 12 people at a time. So it was, it was just incredibly rewarding professionally. Yeah. The patients loved it. It was a win-win. Yeah. Uh, so when I got to interviewing here with Tamara, one of the things that they were really interested in is hiring somebody that had functional medicine experience with several different business models under their belt, who was interested in really rolling out a, a serious attempt at shared group medical practice. You've become known for, uh, and teaching in IFM for the men's health stuff, and obviously you've got OBGYNs and pediatricians here as well. You know, how do you, how do you feel about the sort of the range of, of um, care delivery that you guys are, are offering now? Yeah, that was, that was the other thing that kind of sealed the deal for me is the, uh, the multi-specialty approach. I've been in a family practice uh, PA kind of deal the, the last 30 years and to have across the hallway a board certified ob guy who's functionally trained to have a nurse midwife, multiple nurse practitioners that are women's health specialists, a pediatrician with Dr. Bruce here um, that's, that's talking about methylation at a depth I've never understood uh, is amazing. It's yeah. super fun to, to come out and collaborate professionally. And, and when you realize that you have um, all these people looking at things just a little bit differently, uh, lots on, on methylation and, and energy medicine and homeopathic uh, kinds of approaches with peds just because it's safer, it's less expensive. Yeah. With women's healthcare, you know, you've got the hormone dysfunctions, which are largely dis a, a function of, of gut that's disordered yeah. and, and metabolism of these things where we really shine. There's a synergy here that I haven't experienced before. So it's super empowering. 
Well, Doc, congratulations. Well Can't played. Shake. We'll do a COVID knuckle. We'll do a COVID knuckle. All right. Dr. Mark, Hol- Mark Holthouse, he is here at Functional Medicine Idaho as the Chief Medical Officer. Exciting times ahead, and uh, we'll check out the next segment. All right, we are here at Functional Medicine Idaho and with someone who has been on the Functional Forum before, Tom Molter. Tom, welcome to Idaho. I know you've been here for a while. Tell us a little bit about why you're here. Well, I'll tell you what, James, it's pretty exciting. We have a really great crew of conventionally trained medical practitioners who've now branched over into functional medicine. And they wanna really kind of be the bridge from what the original mindset was to now the new mindset of, hey, let's get to the root cause. Let's really help people feel better. Let's get away with a lot of these whole diagnostics using synthetics to like, hey, let's change your life and therefore change your health. So it's, it's rad, it's an incredible amount of momentum. You know, everybody's really excited. They're very outdoorsy here in Idaho. There's a lot of rivers, a lot of mountains, you know, and the people are really open to what's going on with the shift, I would say, of functional medicine now in, in modern era. Yeah. So uh, it's just exciting. It's exciting to be here in Idaho. What was it about the vision for what they're doing here that got you to come and, and move and spend a lot of your time in Boise? They're just open. They want to learn everything. They want to know the chemistry. They want to know all about the supplementation, the lifestyle stuff. You know, they're just really open. They're really ready. They're really hungry and they're really excited. And they're just down to earth people. You know, it's a really great crew here. It's like a family. So what is your role in uh, in the clinic and what have you been doing up until now? And how do you see that role changing? Oh, yeah. Well, you know, I, I have 15 years of functional medicine experience, you know, I have faculty. So I just kind of teach what I have been taught. So the lessons of Sid Baker and Jeff Bland and, and uh, Joe Pizzorno and whatnot. And uh, you know, whether it's detox, dietary stuff, digestion stuff, but right now it's, it's a lot of nutritional biochemistry. So uh, I was taught by Richard Lord and Andy Browley years ago, you know, through their books and classes and, and in person. Um, so I'm teaching people how to, then the clinicians here, look at somebody's internal chemistry to align it with the external picture. So we look at the nutrient deficiencies, whether they're fatty acids, amino acids, B vitamins, whatnot, and then show why a person is having a disease. It's really interesting, you know, this whole theme of today's forum is on practice resilience, right? And as you have these clinics that look to kind of scale up and meet the demand, meet the need for functional medicine, there's gonna to need to be, you know, some some resilience built into that system. And uh, I would just love to, to get your thoughts on, you know, sort of your mentorship that you received and now mentoring other clinicians who may be new to functional medicine and what that journey's like. Oh gosh, well, I received mentorship from so many different areas, Autism Research Institute, gastroenterologists, you know, Alessio Fasano, worked with him for a while at ARI. Um, you know, I, I just glean every little piece of information I can get. And the resiliency is basically somebody being able to pivot, right? So somebody being able to look at one aspect of medicine, and then when that's not working, look at another aspect of medicine. And really, I would say, always grounding in what we consider to be the foundations, always grounding in you know, the diet, the stress, the toxins, the microbes, the allergens, look looking at proper nutrition, nutritional biochemistry, looking at sleep, looking at exercise, stress stress reduction, and then love and connection, right? So all the foundational pieces. And what's exciting here is that, you know, in my own practice, I didn't have as diverse a team, right? We have the functional health coaches, we have the nutritionists, we have the pediatrician, we have the OB, we have the cardiology expert, we have all these different facets of people working together to cover all the bases. And that, That piece is like you start out by mentoring what is functional medicine, right? Functional medicine is basically getting to the root of what life is, right? It's about air, it's about water, it's about soil, it's about interaction of life, it's about humans loving one another and caring for one another and having these incredible visits one-on-one, you know? And you inspire from that level as a mentor. And then from that, you get into the nuantic pieces, right? And you're like, well, look at that anxiety. You know, they're, they're edgy. They're not sleeping very well. Let's look at the chemistry. Well, holy smokes, their tryptophan metabolism is way off. No wonder they're insomniatic. No wonder they're not happy. They need some B6. They have to calm their brain down. You know, you get into the nuantic little pieces after you get the big piece, and yeah. then you come back out to the big piece, you know? So it's, it's exciting. I don't know. There's so much to mentor. How fun is it watching the clinicians who have been trained in, in conventional medicine kind of get it? and then (laughs) taking the training wheels off and like going for it. We have these training sessions every Thursday, right? And so uh, I've been dominating those lately with nutritional biochemistry talks. And to have the the light bulb go on has gotta be the best feeling in the world from a mentor standpoint, you know? So my chest swells and I look at these people and they're like, I've been working with this client for the last 16 months and I wasn't making any progress and now I get it, you know? It's 
fantastic. I mean, really, to see somebody who's frustrated, to see somebody who's closed down, to see、mm. somebody who's run out of options, like all of a sudden just perk up, have their eyes and their heart open wide, and just go. This is what I've been looking for. You know, I've I've been looking for the missing piece, and this is it. I mean, it's it's incredible, man. It just gives shivers up your spine. You know, yeah. yeah.、Um, you know, obviously, you've been here and part of the team since COVID. Yeah, and, yeah. And、uh, obviously, there's been some like pivoting, and that's a big part of resilience、oh, yeah. is like adapting to it. Yeah, yeah. What has been some of the sort of highs and lows and adaptation from from your perspective? Oh, it's so tough to do、uh, visits via video. That you know you don't get to necessarily feel that person's energy and or interact, but、uh, we made it work. I mean, you know, the Zoom platform works, and you get excited with people, and they get excited with you, and you can see their facial expressions, and you do follow ups, you know, online through your EMR and whatnot, and it works out. It works out. But having it back in the clinic now with masks and proper, you know, protocols and whatnot. It's so much more personal. I think it's 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 amazing to have that back. But yeah, we've had to do some shared medical visits. We've had to do some educational stuff to you know peak the excitement for the clinicians and for the clients. But that's that's always amazing. You know, having more than one person in a group, like I did a detox group, and you have you know fifteen, sixteen people in this group at a time. And wow, they feed off each other. You know, one person's like, "Yeah, I tried this. I felt better. Oh, yeah, I tried that. That didn't work." And oh, well, did you do this? You know, you have this interplay, this excitement. It, it works. You can still do the virtual space and the, the in-person stuff during COVID nineteen for sure. Beautiful. And、um, you know, what would you say to you know? There's other clinicians who watch this across the country that are either like building a functional medicine practice or thinking about shifting to functional medicine. You know,、uh, you know, from your experience of, of being here, what would you say to them? Hit it! <laughs> Don't hesitate. Jump right in. Like, come on. Like, I. I, I've seen what happens in conventional practices. You know, you use antiquated solutions for an issue and never address the problem. So a person might have a symptom go away, and then six months later, they have now more symptoms and more issues and more symptoms. And years down the line, after they've done tons of antibiotics and PPIs and all sorts of synthetic interventions, they're still falling apart. Yeah. Right. Whereas in the functional medicine mindset in the model, all of a sudden people start building themselves back up. So speaking of resilience, you know they go from a place of being really shaky to then all of a sudden being confident, and then you see their eyes open wide and their hearts open wide, and then all of a sudden the things that they thought they'd never be able to do, they're out doing,、yeah. and it's great. You run into them on the mountain bike trails, you run into them on the river, and they're living their lives, man. It's awesome. It's great. Yeah. Well, dude, best of luck here. I'm super excited that you've landed here. I'm very excited about this project, and、uh, I'm excited to see where they can take it. And I know with、uh, you know you there in that in that clinical mentorship role, I know that the results will be great, and it's a big part of the the vision. So, Tom Maltez here at、uh, Functional Medicine Idaho. We'll check out the next segment. So on the theme of practice resilience, we have to talk about our practice accelerator. You know, there are two times a year when we onboard practitioners and clinics into our practice accelerator. Now is one of those times. If you're interested in finding out more, you can book a time on the link below to speak with one of our team about to see if it's right for you. Over the last four years, we have helped hundreds of clinics, just like Functional Medicine Idaho, build strong systems around education, marketing, new patient acquisition, and technology that have helped them build a more resilient practice. And it's been amazing this year to watch some of the practices in our accelerator grow and thrive during COVID by having strong telemedicine systems, doing virtual group visits, and innovating on the front lines of medicine. So, if that sounds like something that you want for your clinic, Please get in touch. Check out the Practice Accelerator. Check out the next segment. So next up, we are going to take a journey from Boise, Idaho, to Sacramento, California, to check in with two pediatricians that have been on the Functional Forum before. Dr. Nicole Shorrock and Katie Long have been working in a hospital-based, insurance-based pediatric practice for the last few years, and during COVID, had to pivot. Towards having their own private practice and、uh, building a membership model, they were able to do that in record time. It's an amazing story of practice resilience. Let's go and check it out. All right, we are here at Oli Health in Sacramento, California, for an incredible story of practice resilience. I'm super excited to be here with Dr. Nicole Shorrock and Dr. Katie Long, who've been on the forum before. And before we get into this incredible story of practice resilience, that's going to bring in COVID and hospitals and starting a new practice in just a few days, I got something that I want to tell you guys. 
On the very first functional forum, my first daughter, Kaliana, was about six months old and there's some great pictures uh, from them, but I have some exciting news in that my family is actually going to be a patient here at Volley Health because my wife, Rachel, is pregnant and you guys are going to be my pediatricians. <laughs> yes, awesome. So That's super great. excited to be part of it and uh, yeah, just so grateful that a clinic like this is 10 minutes from my house. That's oh, huge. Wonderful, Congratulations. James. What an honor. Thank you. Okay. All right, so let's uh, let's jump into it. So back in March or in February, we did an event at UC Davis to talk to uh, students about the potential of getting into functional medicine. At that time, you guys were practicing inside a hospital system. Um, you had a, a chronic pediatric practice there, and you've been doing that for a number of years. Now you have uh, this new practice. So what happened? Hmm. Well, we had a breakup okay. after 15 years. But the short story is that there was a change of guard. The new CEO of the hospital didn't really share the vision of bringing functional medicine to the community. And hospital administration definition of success was how much money is the clinic making? And it really isn't just, or really wasn't just about how many patients we were seeing a day, but also how much ancillary services we were using. How, how many of our patients went into the emergency room or how many of our patients were referred for surgeries or used laboratory or x-ray. And the truth is, is that we were chronic underutilizers of those services. And uh, in that case, we weren't making the hospital much money. Good answer. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, look, I hear that, you know, I definitely heard that a lot from functional and integrated practices where, you know, you start, if you start getting people better, they don't need everything else. And uh, I would say that's probably just the same in, in primary care and in particularly in pediatrics, right? True. At one point, we actually received a letter from the administration saying that we were in the red for underutilization of our emergency department services. And it was not a congrats letter by any means. And um, I'm sure the irony won't be lost to this crowd, but essentially we were keeping our patients too healthy in a hospital system to make the hospital money. And we have zero patients that have been born into our care, children who have developed autism in our practice. And we feel that you can't be more successful than that. Mm -hmm. um, but that obvious win for our patients wasn't financially sustainable in the here and now of our local hospital economics. Yeah, so you've been an employee of that system for what, for 15 years, so that must have come as a bit of a shock. So tell us what happened from that. Well, um, it was definitely a shock and we, we took us a couple of days, I think, to get upright. Um, one of the biggest pieces of that, though, was the support of the local functional forum uh, community, the tribe of providers in our area that we've been supported by really from the very beginning. And uh, I, I'll never forget because we received a phone call from um, our dear friend, Bill Barley, who is a functional uh, family medicine doctor in the area. And he really pulled us off the ground. You know, he said, girls, this is gonna be the best thing that ever happened to you. You uh, can do this. You can open a private practice. You can open a membership model. He told us about how he had done that and how successful it was. And we had hope for the first time. And so that was the day after we found out that the clinic was closed. And from that moment on, um, uh, Dr. Barley was instrumental in helping us develop our model and uh, holding our hands, as were you, James, and the uh, Practice Accelerator. You know, for uh, the access to the online um, Facebook groups and the educational interviews and also um, our peers, we had the answer to every question that we could think of at our fingertips. And we were diving in, in full force, probably it felt like 18 to 20 hours a day um, in the beginning to really figure out what this was because we for so long had been employed physicians with really no awareness of how to have a private practice or be in private practice. And um, it was uh, a lot of work and also a lot of fun. Yeah. So a 30 day transition from employed physician to having a new membership practice would be a legendary story of practice resilience in any time in the world. But this actually happened like during COVID as well. So can you just talk us through like the timing and, and uh, what, what were some of the complications in that? 
I think one of the reasons that we were so uh, felt so much pressure to get the clinic started so quickly is we were given 30 days. We had 2,000 pediatric patients who really didn't have anywhere else to go. And the clinic was to be closed on April 30th, which was really the peak of COVID in our area. And uh, so we opened our new practice on May 1st. Uh, we were, yeah, we were still working full time at the other clinic in that last 30 days and possibly even harder, I would say, than we had in previous months trying to wrap up care for so many patients while spending somehow a eight to 12 more hours a day on top of that, trying to find a space and talk to all of these colleagues. You know, we had Dr. Holthouse, Dr. Burke, Dr. Barley, his wife, Dr. Shroon, um, spent time with Dr. Benton, yourself, really everybody just was helping us, you know, find the strength to do that in such a difficult time. Wonderful. So what did you learn from the last practice that you, when you were thinking about this sort of blue ocean of like, hey, what's the practice going to be? What are we, how are we going to do it? What did you learn from the first practice that informed the, the, the model you have here? At our previous practice, we were, you know, really fortunate to be working in a setting where we were trying to build a successful functional medicine clinic in an insurance-based hospital-associated practice. But what we learned was in order for that to be successful, we needed to have a very forward um, thinking hospital administration. And it requires an entirely different skill set to build something new. What we ran into was a lot of maintaining and attempting to improve upon something that already existed. Mm -hmm. And it became very clear that we couldn't just practice functional medicine in a conventional medicine model. Mm -hmm. And we have complete creative license and freedom to make our own model now at Ollie Health. Um, so coming from that start of stress and fear and worry through that experience with our colleagues helping us to figure out how to do this, we've now entered this transition of this was the best thing that probably ever happened for us mm -hmm. and our patients. Absolutely. We also had practiced and played with different models in our previous clinic. We had uh, uh, probably, I think, one of our biggest strengths was the team approach that we had. We utilized a pediatric dietitian who specialized in functional medicine. We had a somatic educator um, who helped our children with mind, body, and um, and education around how to um, regulate their nervous system and their responses. And we had health coaches and nurses and, and nurse practitioners. And it was really a whole team approach. And we knew we needed to bring that to our private practice um, at, while maintaining a low overhead because we're starting a new business. So yeah. that was one of our big um, pieces. The other thing, and I think in our old practice, we had a really high demand for the practice. We had over 700 families on our wait list. And uh, so we knew that this model needed to be able to meet that demand for the patients that wanted this care. And we had just started the group visits, the shared medical visits in our old practice, and they were hugely successful. Yeah. We were finding that it was helping us reach more people, but then of course, with that added benefit of creating an environment where there's true community, shared experiences, and helping our patients stay motivated and be accountable to their treatment plans. So we knew we needed to bring group visits into our new, new model. We wanted to strengthen our social media presence as well. So we started a Facebook group in our prior practice and what we learned pretty quickly was some of these things that we were teaching our families in the clinic, they were turning around and teaching other families, other members of the community. So not only did that help make our job a little bit easier, it became like the sixth man in basketball where we had our clinic, but we had this whole other healing modality taking on, you know, a world of its own on the other side. And that helped us a lot coming into the new practice to realize that was something we had a little bit more freedom now to expand upon. Um, so we have an open Facebook community called Ollie Health Wellness Community. And that has, I think, a little over 750 um, families in yeah. the community at this point. 
It's open to anyone who wants to join. Approval by a moderator is needed, but just with you know like-mindedness and similar interests. And we took that one step further at Ollie Health and also added a members only group. And what we've loved seeing is that our members of Ollie Health actually enjoy being part of both communities yeah. because the members only group will have information and education shared that's only a benefit of membership. But in the open wellness community, they can add friends and family, you know, work colleagues, people yeah. that they feel would benefit from that community. So it isn't lost on us that not every family who wants to belong to a functional medicine practice can do that, but we love that they can all belong to our online community. Yeah, and they're truly helping each other. You know, they, they go to, as far as like, they'll share recipes or they'll share tricks or trip, you know, tools to like help through something that's difficult that they've yeah. done, or even just having their suffering heard by someone who's experienced similar things, that that's a powerful um, tool, I think, for supporting wellness. Yeah, especially dealing with chronically ill kids. You know, there are things that you learn along the way, just getting medication or getting food into them, you know, which are, are things you learn. I've said forever just how powerful that, that information transfer can be. So I'm super excited to, to hear that. So tell us a little bit about the model. I think you guys are sort of moving towards a direct primary care model. Is that right, Katie? Yeah, we're technically not direct primary care, but at a surface level, we operate very similar to that. We were recommended a wonderful lawyer, Jim Eichen, who had a series of online educational videos similar to your version of a practice accelerator. Yep. This is almost like a legal practice accelerator um, where he covered anything from the different practice models you could consider, you know, what was the best fit for you to even like marketing considerations. And what we were advised is that if we were to brand ourselves as a true direct primary care clinic, it could have a negative impact on certain patients' ability to get reimbursement through things like their HSA and FSA um, funds. And another aspect of that was to be, you know, a diehard DPC clinic. Most providers are officially opted out of insurance plans. And we enjoy the possibility that our patients can submit super bills to their insurance plan still for potential plan covered benefits. Um, another aspect was job flexibility. We had colleagues that basically went through a route where it can be very difficult to be employed as a physician if you're opted out of insurance plans because of the amount of time it takes to opt back in. And we're very grateful that we didn't end up needing to get a part-time or a locums position in this transition. But when you're building a startup business, freedom and options are everything. So we decided to stay opted in to insurance plans, but we are not billing them directly and considered more of an out-of-network provider. Great. So tell us a little bit about the, the, the market specifically, because I know that um, you know there's been some really innovative models that we've shown here on the Functional Forum where direct primary care style memberships can actually be affordable to normal people. And I just would love to hear about what you came up with for, because there's a range of people in, in these clinics too. There's people with seriously chronically ill patients, which I know is some of your specialty, but you also have like regular kids, right? Yes, so we were extremely motivated by and dedicated to our previous community. And at our old practice, about 30% of our patients were from low income families. And so this transition at first seemed very daunting to us. Um, we wanted to create something for everyone. And in the long run, that something for everyone mentality and goal, I think is what helped us to be so resilient in this transition to Ollie Health. Um, we are fortunate enough to continue to care for about 70% of our former patients from our insurance-based practice. Yep. Our membership, more specifically, it's a tiered monthly membership structure. So they start at $40 per month 
And each of our membership includes um, services, medical services. So from the physicians, our health coach, our dietitian, the somatic educator, um, we added complementary medicine services too, like frequency specific microcurrent and ionic foot bath sessions. Okay. Really anything that we could come up with that seemed to optimize the terrain to prevent and reverse complex chronic disease is included in the memberships. And what we found is some families will opt for more inclusive memberships and they either feel that they're going to need to rely upon our services more frequently or they have high deductible PPO insurance plans in which their out of pocket expenses in our new practice, Ollie Health, over the course of the year are much less expensive than they were at our insurance based practice because of the differences in billing. Yeah. On the other hand, some patients will opt for less inclusive memberships. So we have, like you mentioned, a lot of healthy families who don't expect that they're need, going to need to be seen very frequently, um, or they have phenomenal insurance coverage and they choose to follow more of a fee for service type of model here at Ollie Health and then submit their super bills to their insurance for reimbursement for plan covered services. So I remember about a year ago, you and I had a conversation where you had a vision for changing the well baby visit. And, you know, here we are an opportunity a year later where you get to call the shots, right? So what is that? What do you see that looking like? Yes. So that experience has been so fun for us because it started, you know, at the ground level, I think just in that conversation with you at the new health tour. Um, and and from there, with our you know new creative license here, we developed an entire membership model that surrounds what's called the Bambinos. And our Bambinos are essentially a membership that involves shared well child care for children ages two and under. And um, as we worked through that, the way that it really looks today is there is a community session where we have moms and dads and their small children experiencing education around nutrition, sleep, development, um, more, and in a safe space where they can share, they can ask questions. Our health coach and our dietitian rotate through those sessions and the information that's um, you know, taught to the parents in that. And they get to spend you know, upwards of 30 to 45 minutes with the family in that group before they even come see us individually as the pediatrician. So we then will spend an additional 15 minutes with the family doing our physical exam, you know, medical assessment, developmental assessment, and then answering physician specific questions. So not only do our parents love the Bambino because it provides more like a mommy or daddy and me style of group for their well child care and they meet other families in the community. But from a practice perspective, each of us individually can see, you know, about four well child visits in the period of one hour of physician time, yeah. which is a lot from a, you know, solely functional and integrative medicine clinic. Yeah. Our Bambino groups, what we learned is because we require so much less physician time, we all know that less physician time means less cost to the clinic. So it's become one of our most inclusive yet least expensive membership programs at Ollie Health. Yeah, I definitely see that the future of growing, you know, making more affordable this kind of care is, is, uh, is delivering groups for sure. And one thing that I wanted to say was that not only can we do this, but we can have fun doing it. And that's definitely something that's played out for us. Um, this sense of freedom, um, but also full, like fun, creativity and feeling like what we're doing has value. We're no longer checking boxes just because somebody says we have to check a box or diving deep and feeling overwhelmed because we're the only person responsible for this care and not having all the time and resources we need to do that. This current model has been actually a lot of fun. Beautiful. That's what I like to hear. Well, it's putting the well back in the well child visit. I mean, I can just see that that's what, you know, new parents need, new mothers need, what the kids need to really be part of that community and understand how to keep the kids healthy. And you compare and contrast that with the, you know, the sort of industrial well child visit where not really a lot of wellness is happening. So I'm, I'm super excited about that and uh, excited to be part of it personally and I'm excited to, to, to participate in it too. So 
Where, where else have you found some like uh, creative license with your own, uh, now that you have your own practice to do the medicine that you've seen work with kids? Yeah, that, I think that sense, sense of freedom has been one of the biggest blessings with this transition. We think that um, there were lots of tools that we wanted to use in our previous practice that we really couldn't open up to in that model. And uh, I believe that energy medicine is the future of medicine. And we've been using frequency specific microcurrent, which is um, an energy medicine device mm -hmm. um, as one of our healing modalities. And we've been able to bring that in to our practice. Um, and it's been a game changer. Um, also, we have been able to utilize our somatic educator who is helping our children with um, both um, energy work in the body, but also um, educating the children and the parents on and, and our adult patients too, um, on how to sense energy in the body, move through energy um, blocks, because what we're experiencing is that in complex chronic disease, it's complicated and a lot of times there can be history of trauma and that trauma can live in the body. Mm. And one of our biggest roadblocks is the nervous system's response and being kind of stuck in that trauma mode. Yeah. And you know, the cell danger response, but in the, in the global sense of a nervous system. So being able to use the energy medicine techniques to help um, patients help themselves and yeah. empower our patients to really understand their bodies and move that energy through the body and move through a trauma, whether it was significant or maybe didn't seem significant, but still resulted in uh, a block in the body is is awesome. And we have that full creative license now to, to bring that into the clinic and not have to worry about having to talk it over with uh, someone who is not even in integrative medicine yeah. and, and, and hope that they want to do it too. Yeah, absolutely. So when we did the tour earlier, um, I saw that you guys have a uh, pretty awesome telemedicine set up there at the back. Obviously, this is the micro practice, and we, you know, we talked about the low, you know, the need for a low overhead model, especially if we're doing it in thirty days. Um, what's it like doing pediatrics over telemedicine, and, and what are you guys doing in telemedicine that you think is so unique uh, in this model? We've been having a great experience with telemedicine so far. So we're pediatricians, of course, but another newfound freedom with Ollie Health is relying on our functional training, which is adult as well as pediatric. So we've been able to bring a lot of parents in um, to the practice as well. And as a lot of us know, if you have one or two or four or five small children at home, it can be difficult to make it to visits to actually care for yourself. Mm -hmm. So I've been a big fan of you know, meeting moms at the nap time hour for their visits. We do some, uh, have some flexibility certain evenings to make telemedicine um, groups especially happen for families after bedtime even. Some, our dietitian and our health coach have similar family structure. And so it's brought a lot more flexibility to the practice, but in terms of the, keeping the overhead low, right, you'll see when we do the tour, one of the biggest pieces of advice we got from you in the practice accelerator was just get started and so for us to make that change in that 30-day period we had to really just dive into this and telemedicine was a wonderful way when stay in place orders were pretty strict for even medical visits yeah. we opened our first month was solely for telemedicine mm -hmm. I just want to like wrap up a few things that we've covered here before we get into anything else. So a 30 day transition from practice into the new practice, use of telemedicine, use of the team delivered care, use of groups, going low overhead. I mean, this is an incredible, you know, it's a classic story of what it takes to be resilient and to be able to move with it. Cause you know, any, the, the, the situation that you found yourselves in, I know that in the community right now, there are plenty of clinics that have been furloughed. There are plenty of clinics that have had to change their business model. Like all these things have happened and it's just been amazing to see that you've, you know, not only been able to survive, but actually thrive into, into actually being able to fulfill the vision and move towards the vision that you have. So actually, I'd love to just, you know, I know that this is the first clinic and you've got, you know, your space here, but um, when you see this going, I mean, there's not that many functional medicine pediatricians in the country. And I feel very blessed to, you know, to be here and be, be close to you guys. But what do you see as far as where you think that this can go, um, you know, as far as the vision for Ollie Health? 
I think we share the same vision as, as everyone in functional medicine. I mean, we want to bring true uh, health care and not sick care to a larger group of people. And one of our limitations was that functional medicine, when we do the deep dive and it's doctor centric, it you're not really able to see that many patients. So I think the vision involves using a team approach, bringing in the expertise of our somatic educator, of our dietitian, of our health coaches, um, along with the physician and um, building. And then I would also say the sixth man again, you know, our community of parents and our community of patients also holding up and holding space and educating others who are earlier along in their journeys um, so that we can reach a group, uh, a larger group um, of families in need. I don't think there's ever going to be a shortage of patients. I think that's clear. And the more that we can do to optimize how we can meet that demand, um, the more successful we will feel that we are being. Yeah. So tell us, you know, what do you, what do you see as the vision for Ollie Health in the medium term? So in the medium term, we are really trying to bring energetic medicine more into our practice. We truly feel that that's the future of medicine. And when we're looking at our long-term goals, we share that in common with, I believe, a lot of people that find functional and integrative medicine, right? It's the evolution of medicine. We're realizing that our healthcare system as it currently stands is not sustainable. It's sinking our economy. We've talked about the lifetime care of uh, cost of care for children with autism is going to outcost what we can spend for military, for example. Yeah. So what we would like to do is really make that this type of model become the mainstream model, you know, the more direct care so that we can alleviate that burden from our, you know, the global economy for healthcare. Absolutely. Yeah, I think what's clear is that the current model isn't working and we need to change both the medicine we do and also how we do the medicine we do. Yeah. And that's that that's this element is changing how we do the medicine we do so that we can reach uh, more patients and we can optimize um, the outcomes with the using the fewest amount of resources. Yeah. Well, look, I'm super excited to, to have spent this time with you and to watch the evolution. You know, this is the third time, uh, well, actually the fourth time, I think, on the mm -hmm. Functional Forum across the different events that we've had and just, you know, charting your progress from, you know, doing, being one of the only functional medicine pediatricians and practicing inside the system to, you know, really uh, delivering that kind of care and, and joining forces, you know, as a team to now being able to like express yourself and be able to deliver the care that you want to deliver and take it to the next level with, uh, you know, with your team here, and uh, I'm super excited about everything. And, and really, you know, we need, you know, we need for functional medicine to have an impact at a population level, right? Functional medicine has not got anywhere close to doing that. And if we're going to do that, we have to use some of the tools that we've spoken about today. We have to use community. We have to use technology. We have to use a different operating system medicine to focus on self-efficacy. And there's so much opportunity to get parents to support each other. And if we start these kids on the right foot, that's the only way uh, that we're going to turn things around. So congratulations on the clinic. Super excited to be here. And uh, thanks so much for um, being pioneers in your space. And I look forward to... Uh, being part of the future of Holy Health. And we look forward to that too. Thank, Thank you, you, James. Thanks so much for joining us here at the Functional Forum. I hope you've learned some things that you can take back to your clinic. There are so many opportunities to build the future of healthcare, and we're here to help you to do that. Thanks so much for tuning in, and we'll see you next time.